good afternoon. Uh, for some of you, even good morning uh, or even good evening. Um, I'm Lucy Barber. I'm a trustee at the Anglican Pacifist Fellowship, and we are really pleased to welcome you, people from around the world, to this vigil uh, to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the first atomic bombing. We extend a special welcome to the many colleagues from our sister organisation, the Episcopal Peace Fellowship in the US. As Christians, we are called to work for peace. And so we appeal for peace, not as a political issue, but as a human one. Our awareness of this call is influenced today by the horrors inflicted by nuclear weapons 75 years ago in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. As we gather in our homes around the world, we pray that this anniversary will signal a renewed effort by all to eliminate these weapons of mass destruction. During our time together, we will be hearing reflections from a number of people. Some have been recorded um, and some will be live. We shall also be sharing some prayers and the music, and I hope you will join in with the music as you feel comfortable. It would also be wonderful if you would like to share any of your own thoughts, reflections or prayers and you can do this by um, typing into the chat icon, which should be on your screen. APF will then save these and put them into a compilation on our website and social media platforms. And so let us start with a prayer. God, our creator and sustainer. We gather to pray as a broken people who today remember the darkness and shadow of death and destruction 75 years ago caused by nuclear weapons. We know that we deal falsely with the world and with ourselves, healing wounds too lightly by saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. Let there be sown in us anew the unity, the light, and the peace which passes all understanding. Be with us today and keep our minds and hearts in you and in your peace. Amen. In a moment, we will have a song which tells the story of Sadako Sasaki. Sadako was only two years old on the 6th of August, 1945. Sadako was blown out of a window, and although her clothes were burnt, she was not hurt. However, at the age of 11, Sadako was diagnosed with leukemia. She became very ill and had to go into hospital. While there, her father told her the Japanese legend that if you fold 1,000 paper cranes, you would be granted a wish. Sadako started folding cranes and made a thousand with a wish that she would get well. She then started on another thousand, but sadly only made 600 by the time she died on the 25th of October, 1955. Her classmates laid, um, classmates laid paper cranes on her grave and started a campaign for a statue of her. It is now called the Children's Peace Monument in Hiroshima Peace Park, and it is a very moving place to visit. Today, I made my own crane because I felt it would give me time to think and reflect on all that we are thinking about today. And if you want to do that after this, then I will be posting a link to how you can make one um, onto our Facebook pages. So do check that out. And the song which tells the story um, is called Cranes Over Hiroshima. The baby As the sun falls from the sky, she feels the stings of a thousand fires as a city around her dies. Some sleep beneath the rubble, some wake to a different world. From the crying babe will grow. Summers fade to autumn, ten winter snows have passed. She's a child of dreams and answers. She's a racer, strong and fast. But the headaches come ever more often, and the dizziness always returns. And the word that she hears is loose. Oh, 
Friends, thank you for the privilege of being able to share this vigil and with you to remember 75 years ago, the dropping of the atom bomb. It's a particular irony for those of us who are Christians, but the day chosen for that atrocity was the Feast of the Transfiguration. When Christians remember that Jesus was transfigured by an uncreated light, a light that shone to bring healing and goodness and the life of God with us. 
And yet what we remember today is a created light, a light that shone with violence and with evil, a light that took so many thousands of lives, 70 to 80,000 people in Hiroshima. And then subsequently, three days later, no one knows how many, somewhere between 35 and 70,000 more in Nagasaki. Tens of thousands of lives snuffed out in a second. And here we are in the middle of the coronavirus, rightly grieving that tens of thousands of lives over months are being lost. But somehow we have forgotten that in a matter of seconds, huge numbers of people lost their lives because of that created light that brought nothing but pain. And even now, we continue to invest in these engines of created light. And even now, the risk of that pain is a real risk in the world. For me as a Christian, my faith is in the one who brings the uncreated light, the light of healing and strength. Years ago, as national co-chair of Christian CND, I would sit with many sisters and brothers and protest outside Lake and Heath, Upper Hayford, support the women who protested outside Greenham Common, attend Cruise Watch, together with my present friend and colleague, the Archbishop of Liverpool, Malcolm McMahon. He, like me, was someone who spoke out for peace. And yet here we are years later, still investing in engines of destruction, still committed as a nation to that which produces the created light that kills and destroys. It should not go on. And I commit myself, I who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and in the light that he shines, I commit myself to working for peace and to resisting evil. You may know the story of the great peace protester in the United States, A.J. Must, who towards the end of his life when the Vietnam War was raging there would stand outside the White House day after day, a man in his 80s holding a candle, rain or shine, day after day, a newspaper came up to interview him and said to him, AJ, do you really think you're going to change the world by doing this? And AJ replied, I may not change the world by doing this, but I will make sure that the world does not change me. As we stand in vigil, remembering the created light that killed we are determined that the world will not change us, that we will remain awake and speak truth as we can to power. But also we believe that if we say it clearly enough, if we say it often enough, if we point with enough regularity, to the foolishness of created destruction, then we will indeed change the world. That's my hope. And it's a hope that I share with you. We keep vigil to remember those tens of thousands of people who died in a split second in Hiroshima, Nagasaki. We keep vigil for our own children and grandchildren yet unborn, that they may have a world worth living. May God bless you today on this feast of the transfiguration, the uncreated light of healing. May it shine in your lives. Amen.
I was 13 and in my first year at high school. I was pushing my bike against the wind in a steady drizzle on the morning of the 7th of August, 1945. This was in Dunedin, New Zealand, where I grew up. I'd heard the early morning news on Radio 4YA. I was even then the news addict that I still am now pushing 90. Day by day, I'd followed the whole Second World War. But this was not like other mornings. Yesterday, one American bomb, called an atomic bomb, had wiped out the whole Japanese city. That blew my mind. How could it happen? Just maybe, we thought, our physics master might be able to help us. He took the second lesson that day. He had no forewarning as our hands shot up. Please, sir, can you explain to us how one bomb can destroy a whole city? What is an atomic bomb? Mr. Roberts did his best to explain nuclear fission or was it fusion? Of course, we didn't understand. I still don't. But as our physics master went to leave the classroom, he turned back. I can tell you one thing, boys. Either we abolish war or war will abolish us. Roberts was not just an excellent teacher. The words that ended this lesson were a lesson for life. I cannot forget it. But that lesson has yet to be sufficiently learned by those in power. Though it is disputed, we can now say with confidence that the bomb that turned a hundred thousand human beings in Hiroshima into ashes in a split second, and the second bomb three days later in Nagasaki with another 80,000 dead and many, many more who later died of radiation sickness. We know now that these two bombs did not end a world war, as we have been asked to believe. Japan was putting out feelers for peace. These were political weapons to demonstrate American power. One could argue that they inaugurated the Cold War that was soon to follow. The Japanese victims had paid the price for a subsequent nuclear holocaust that might well, but did not happen. More than once, it very nearly did. Throughout the long years of the Cold War, statesmen, almost like a miracle, did not lose their heads. Thanks to that successful gamble on their sanity, and I should surely add, by the grace of God, we survive today. But for how much longer? How much longer in these times of political insanity? Make our nation great seems to be saying we need the bomb. It was no surprise that before long the Soviet Union had it. 
Britain too, and France and China and India with Pakistan in tow. And an open secret, Israel. Who else? North Korea. Significantly, not Japan. But hold your breath for a year or two. It is easily forgotten that Mandela's South Africa virtually had it and then wisely decided against. Germany has abstained, but not really. Along with the rest of NATO, Germany shelters under the American nuclear umbrella, a kind of morality on the cheap. Speaking today for the Christian peace movement, it is obvious to me, even though still far from obvious to many others, that the possession and readiness to use weapons of mass destruction is incompatible with the teaching of Jesus of Nazareth, as he says, but I say to you, love your enemies, they that live by the sword shall die by the sword. These teachings continue to be disregarded by most Christians. The case for nuclear disarmament, however, needs to be made for that very reason, again and again and again. The Trident submarine fleet, a mere fragment of the global nuclear arsenal, amounts, it needs to be faced, the saying, if need be, we are prepared to commit mass murder. Nuclear weapons are an abomination. There is no rational case for them, let alone a moral or a theological one. With hindsight, Churchill described even the blanket conventional bombing of civilians as state terror by a different name. Two days after Nagasaki, President Truman said in his own defense, if we are dealing with a beast, we have to treat the beast like a beast. That is ultimate dehumanization. To recruit God in mitigation for all this, as happened recently in Westminster Abbey, is quite simply blasphemous. Pope Francis has spoken for Christendom by saying as much, though in his loving, measured language, which leaves no room for hatred, only for forgiveness. There is good news globally in the context of the United Nations. A treaty now exists to make nuclear weapons illegal, like chemical and biological weapons already, an offence against international law. I am speaking these words in New Zealand, one of the nations that has sponsored this treaty. When it is ratified by a sufficient number of nations, it then becomes law. That law challenges the unrepentant nuclear powers. To present that challenge in prayer and in action is the immediate task of the Christian peace movement. And far beyond that, of decent human beings everywhere, the stone figure of the crucified Jesus in the church of St. Francis of Assisi in the city of Nagasaki was molten almost beyond recognition, 
by the explosion of the second atom bomb. That image speaks silently of a suffering God. God's compassionate response to human violence. Henry Jansman here, uh, joining with you from uh, a rather uh, tropical southern New Jersey on uh, this uh, anniversary, this remembrance of 6th August. You know, when I come to this day, there are two images always in my mind. Both are connected to clouds. The first one is an eyewitness testimony from a young schoolboy half a mile from the epicenter of Hiroshima when the moment of impact came. This is what he wrote. My classmates were dying one by one. That made me very frightened. I struggled to free myself from the broken fragments and looked around. Through a hole in the roof, I could see clouds swirling in a cone. Some were black some pink. There were fires in the middle of the clouds. The second image is of another cloud in a different place, on a mountaintop this time, but on the same day. 6 August, the remembrance of the transfiguration of our Savior. And while Peter was still speaking, Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. Let us pray. When Christ appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is, as he is pure, 
all who have grasped this hope in him make themselves pure. So let us confess our sins that mar his image in us. Your unfailing kindness, O Lord, is in the heavens, and your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Your righteousness is like the strong mountains, and your justice as the great deep. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. For with you is the well of life, and in your light shall we see light. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Father in heaven, whose only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, revealed his glory before the chosen witnesses upon the holy mountain, and spoke of the exodus he would accomplish at Jerusalem. Give us strength that we, beholding by faith the light of his countenance, may be strengthened to bear our cross, and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. In the light of great wickedness, on a 75th anniversary of remembrance, let us be encouraged in our confession to know that in Christ, little boys whose testimony was full of fear, and for you and me, who give our own testimony in the wickedness of war and violence, may be resolved in him who said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Peace be with you. Hello, my name is Nagyong Alice. I live in Seoul, Korea, in an intentional community called Baigun Yuri, which means the bright world. While thinking of the Hiroshima Day vessel, I came across an account by Setsuko Tholo, who on the morning of August 6, 1945, witnessed a white flash and the smoke in the air after the bomb was dropped. She was 13 years old. After reading several paragraphs, I had to stop because I was so horrified by even the brief descriptions of what she saw and how she experienced the cessation of her emotions. It was as if I had read about the bombing for the first time. But it was not. I pay attention to the news covering the bombing and the effects of radiation. In 2009, I went to Nagasaki and visited Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Museum, where I read many accounts and saw photos and videos depicting the calamity of the day in 1945. I noticed how forgetful I was and how far removed I was from the realities of the nuclear weapons. Living on the Korean Peninsula, however, you can't really avoid noticing that the nuclear weapons have become almost a household name that gets thrown around in every other conversation on the safety of where I live. And in the northern part of the Korean Peninsula live 20 million people. The world focuses so much on the nuclear weapons that the lives of these individuals are often forgotten. When I was in my 20s, I dreamed about working for the future where I would freely drive through the roads of North Korea to China and to Europe. But then I came to realize soon that I should accept that it may not happen in my lifetime. In tackling a problem of the magnitude of nuclear weapons, it's very important to be prudent, realistic, and persistent. But we also have to remember that lives are at stake at the very moment. It should not be okay to rely on nuclear deterrence when it means the potential is creating another Hiroshima. In my community, Baigun Yuri, we just completed 1,000 days of a life and peace pilgrimage for, life, for peace in Northeast Asia. 
We prayed for and shared our messages on the disarmament and permanent neutrality of the Korean Peninsula. During the three and a half years, we visited about 45 cities and 10 countries around the world where civilians suffered during historical events. We prayed for those souls that suffered and we also met with many people who are seeking and working for peace in the world. It was very encouraging to connect with very many people who were dedicated, who are dedicated to bringing peace to our daily life. We also realized that the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula is tightly aligned with getting rid of all those weapons in the world and with easing the mounting, mounting tensions between the world's superpowers. During the COVID-19 pandemic, I found many silver linings, and one of them is that it has become obvious that nuclear weapons are incapable of solving the world's most pressing problems. We talk about nuclear weapons, but when we talk about it, it's easy to think of them as something not real in our life. While we continue to fight for the grand cause of disarmament, it is important to take action at the ground level. We would be remiss to keep praying for peace without paying attention to the footprints that we leave on the earth. For example, much of the electricity in South Korea comes from nuclear power plants. And the electricity is very cheap. It is one of the only places in the world where electricity is cheaper than gas prices. So in my community, we have worked for and developed an alternative lifestyle where we are mindful and take care in what we consume and how we consume to sustain our daily life. So my message is that, that we remember the past, not to repeat, and to create a world with peace. And as we do that, we also need to keep our actions and ideals in sync. Our path to peace should be a peaceful journey. Thank you very much. Thank you to all those who have contributed to these recordings. Um, I think you'll agree that their words have given us a lot to think about already. And so now I want to welcome you to join me in a short time of silence to reflect on all that we have heard and to remember how the world changed 75 years ago. You. I'd also love to remind you that you are able to add your own prayers or thoughts or reflections. You can tell us where you're from, where you're watching this from, um, by uh, typing into the chat icon. I know a few people have already done that. And it's such a privilege that we are able to do this together globally. And so I think it will be wonderful to see people's prayers on there. And we're also recording this today so that you'll be able to share it with people um, after the vigil. And I know that's a question that's been asked. So now we're privileged to have some live contributions uh, from APF members. And firstly, I want to hand you over to Julia Mercer, APF trustee and member of Trident Plowshares, who is bringing us a very sad and harrowing poem. Thank you, Julia. Hello friends all around the world. Over 50 years ago, when I was a teenager in my big sister's CND group, I learned about what nuclear weapons could do to people's fragile bodies. And that knowledge has led me to use my own body in non-violent resistance to nuclear weapons, sitting down and blockading the places where nuclear weapons are made and stored. This poem is very gruesome. 
but I feel that like with the Holocaust, we need to remember the horror of that day. The poem is by Japanese poet Toge Sankichi, a peace activist and survivor of the Hiroshima bomb. He died in 1953 when he was just 36. And one line, one line may need explaining. Um, there is a reference to stone images of Jizo. And these are small statues, heartbreaking statues, believed in Japanese Buddhist tradition to be the protectors of children and unborn babies. So, August 6th. Can we forget that flash? Suddenly, 30,000 in the streets disappeared. In the crushed depths of darkness, the shrieks of 50,000 died out. When the swirling yellow smoke thinned, buildings split, bridges collapsed, packed trains rested, singed, and a shoreless accumulation of rubble and embers, Hiroshima. Before long, a line of naked bodies walking in groups, crying, with skin hanging down like rags, hands on chests, stamping on crumbled brain matter, burnt clothing covering hips. Corpses lie on the parade ground, like stone images of Chizo, dispersed in all directions, on the banks of the river, lying one on top of another, a group that had crawled to a tethered raft, also gradually transformed into corpses beneath the sun's scorching rays. And in the light of the flames that pierced the evening sky, the place where mother and younger brother were pinned under alive, also was engulfed in flames. And when the morning sun shone on a group of high school girls who had fled and were lying on the floor of the armory in excrement, their bellies swollen, one eye crushed, half their bodies raw flesh with skin ripped off, hairless, impossible to tell who was who, all had stopped moving in a stagnant offensive smell the only sound the wings of flies buzzing around metal basins. City of 300,000, can we forget that silence? In that stillness, the powerful appeal of the white eye sockets of the wives and children who did not return home, that tore apart our hearts, can it be forgotten? So now I'd like to introduce our, um, our chair, Sue, Sue Clayden. Hello. The horrific experiences that we have just heard outlined in that poem and the others of the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki are sadly not, only the, not the only ones who have suffered from nuclear explosions. Between 1952 and 1962, Britain and the United States caused more than 40 nuclear explosions in the atmosphere around Australia and in the Pacific. France carried out tests in this area until the 1970s. Around 21,000 British servicemen were exposed to these explosions. The exact number of civilians who were expo exposed to this radiation is not known, nor the number of children who suffered as a result. Many of the workers and military personnel who staff the Pacific test sites, as well as the indigenous communities on neighboring atolls, 
have faced serious health problems in the aftermath. There is persisting radio contamination, continuing community displacement, and transgenerational harm from these nuclear test explosions. Today, we want to remember and pray for all the victims of these tests. We'll take a moment to remember these mainly unnamed victims. We remember the national servicemen, the Fijian workers, the Marshall Islanders, and other local people who have experienced early deaths or lifelong disabilities. We remember those of the three generations born since these tests with birth defects, as well as the jellyfish babies. We remember those who are still unable to return to their family lands because of the high levels of radiation decades after these tests. We pray and give thanks for all those who have supported and treated these innocent victims over the years. Lord, we ask for relief from suffering of these innocent victims to the race to develop nuclear arms. We pray on this 75th anniversary of the first atomic explosion that our resolve to work for the elimination of all nuclear weapons is strengthened so there will not be any further victims of these immoral weapons. Lord, hear our prayers. Amen. Now I would like to introduce Jeff Smith. Jeff is also an APF trustee, and he is a licensed reader in the church in Wales. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, said Jesus on the cross. The thing is, they did know what they were doing. The bomb was dropped in full knowledge of the consequences. But even so, God's forgiveness can still be there. Although with forgiveness must come some attempt not to do the thing forgiven again. So all we can do is to try to make sure this never does happen again. To heed Christ's command to love our enemies. It's incumbent on us as Christian peacemakers, therefore, to plant the message of peace in people's hearts, the message that war is something they do not want or need. And amazingly, there have been examples of Christian forgiveness, even by the victims of Hiroshima. Takeshi Tamori was one of the few survivors of that day. He lost both of his parents and two sisters. As a young boy, he became a street urchin who struggled to stay alive by searching for food in rubbish bins in what was for many the poverty of post-war Japan. He took an oath to avenge his family's deaths. And at 18, he emigrated to the USA. But due to the interest somebody showed in him there, in his well-being, he was inspired to pursue a life serving others through Christianity and eventually became a Christian minister, but he still found it hard to reconcile this with his experience of Hiroshima. But while crossing the San Francisco Bay Bridge one morning in 1985, he had a moment of sudden inspiration which led him to reject his vow of revenge and instead devote himself to fostering forgiveness. He set himself a lifetime goal of helping future generations live in peace with harmony and equality. He spent the rest of his life trying to defeat what he saw as mankind's greatest enemy, 
fear and the hatred that darkens human hearts. Those things which lead to wars in the first place. He founded a peace institute dedicated to international peace. He has fostered forgiveness and helped others overcome barriers to it. And as well as showing forgiveness, this story also shows the other side of the Christian message, that of love and how Christian love can transform even though who, those who have emerged from being victims of the darkest acts of humanity. And as Christians, we have the surety that even against the background of Hiroshima, that love of Christ is still victorious. Whatever weapons humanity develops, however powerful, they will never beat that love. As St. Paul says in Romans, nothing is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus dying on the cross and rising again from the dead to defeat the evil which humankind is capable of doing and has done shows the victory of that love. He has suffered, as did the victims of Hiroshima. But after that agony, through the resurrection, his victory over that suffering. So the message on this Hiroshima day should be one of love and forgiveness, which if only the world as a whole could heed, would remove the need for war and all its weapons forever. And how that message could change this world, not just making it more peaceful, but enabling it to divert its resources to ensure everybody had enough to eat and healthcare they could rely on instead of having weapons. However horrible the things that human beings can do to each other may be, the love and forgiveness of Christ is still there and is more powerful than anything else in the world and itself cannot be overcome by anything else in the world. That message and the peace which results from it is the one that we must take forward on Hiroshima Day and on any other day when we remember the victims of war. Amen. And I now hand over once more to, to Lucy. Thank you, Jeff, Sue and Julia. And as we come to the end of our time together, I would like to say thank you to everyone who has contributed to this vigil today, to all the speakers, to Sue and Bob Gilmurray for the music, for Arthur and Rob Champion for the wonderful technical support, and for APF's Tilly uh, Martin for her great organisation. And we want to also say a big thank you to you for joining us today, for uniting us all around the world and for continuing to work for peace wherever it is that you live. Our final hymn today was written by APF member Reverend Christopher Idle for the 60th anniversary of Christian CND which fell this year. The words are fitting as they call us to raise our voice to work for the elimination of all weapons of mass destruction. And as we end this time together, I pray that this commitment to raise our voice will be carried with us today. Thank you. Let us persevere, though the road seems 
end tonight's vigil with the universal prayer for peace which we say together heavenly father lead me from death to life from falsehood to truth lead me from despair to hope from fear to trust lead me from hate to love from war to peace let peace fill our hearts, our world, our universe. Amen. <laughs>